Hello, and welcome to Mornings with Joel, commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. Hello, we'd like to welcome you all to the Mornings with Joel CRE podcast. We're very excited to have you with us today. We want to thank all of our guests that are here as well. And I uh, wanted to welcome you to the show. Today, we're really excited. We have a uh, special local guest here in Atlanta, Leonard Adams. And uh, Lynn has been killing it on the west side of Atlanta. And, uh, you know, he's one of those guys where you say, man, who is this dude? We got to get him on the show. So, <laughs> so we're happy to have you here. And uh, Leonard, how you doing this morning or this afternoon? Well, fine, Joe. How you doing, sir, this morning? Glad to be here. Yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. So so to start us off, um, you know, who are you? Why, why did I invite you to be on this show? You know, Chris Communities, we see these signs everywhere. Who who are you? Who am I? <laughs> well, well, you open up with, I've been killing it. I hope, <laughs> I hope the police not looking for me. Yeah, yeah, let's let's clear that up. Good in yeah. business sense. But Joe, hey, hey, I'm just a, hey, I'm a guy out here trying to uh, drive some impact on the west side of Atlanta. About 22 years ago, I decided that I wanted to, uh, you know, make some change in the homeless population that were vulnerable individuals living on the streets. That basically most of them are living with a condition of mental illness, substance addiction, physical disability, or something that's caused causing them to be homeless. And I really my DNA was to offer services to them, uh, but to be able to offer those services to them, Joel, I needed a place to do it. And um, so uh, real estate was just a vehicle for me to be able to offer the services that I yearned for to offer to this vulnerable population uh, and to serve more people. I needed more real estate. And all of a sudden, the real estate started to have its own track. It started to say, hey take care of me, look at me, um, property manage me, uh, I'm an asset, uh, I will break down on you, you know, uh, <laughs> it's a cost for me as well. Mm -hmm. So maybe six years in, Joel, honestly, uh, the real estate started to basically speak to me and say, hey, you bought multiple single family homes, you bought multiple small apartment buildings where you are housing these individuals, but you need to look at me, these assets, as a as more of just a tool to deliver the services. Uh, and that's what I uh, started to look at becoming a CHODO, a community development housing organization. And that was the that we were off to the races there, which led us into our commercial um, development, which I love to talk with on your show today. OK. All right. Well, fantastic. We'll get into that a little bit. So. Did you have a background in in public housing or military or, I mean, because it sounds like you were just flipping homes and, and saw the need to do yeah. that. Well, yeah, well, I mean, what, yeah, those roots, where, where did all oh. this come from? Oh, well, let me tell you, those <laughs> roots, those roots come from entrepreneurship, man. My, uh, you know, coming from Detroit, Michigan, I was the little boy that shoveled the snow that left out at 7 a.m. when the sun cracked. And I was out all day till it got dark out there with with a uh, paper uh, paper. Uh, I'm sorry, plastic bags on my uh, over my socks in my boots, making oh, sure man. I yep. had some weather protection. <laughs> you know, had the double set of gloves. You know, yep. and I was yep. I was out there. I didn't call myself an entrepreneur, but my my modeling was. I was the paper route guy that had delivered the papers, and when other routes came available, I took them on. So I always had this kind of work ethic because my, my parents were entrepreneurs and uh, it was just in my DNA. So I ended up, uh, you know, basically starting an employment agency uh, with my family in the mid to uh, early 90s uh, after I came out of uh, the Knoxville College, uh, mm -hmm. historical black college in East Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, started an employment agency. But believe it or not, Joel, the employment agency introduced me to the homeless population. Okay. We had, a, we had a labor pool, which was basically pay by the day, work today, get paid today. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people in the homeless population, this is what they do. They leave the shelters or leave from up under where they're staying, come to a temp service, catch a job for the day, 
finish that job and get a check that evening and pay for their life expenses out of that one check and do and recycle it and do it all over again the next day, the next day. So this was my introduction to uh, the homeless population. So how did this all come about? Um, my purpose came to me and as I shared with my mom, she said, you've always been for the underdog. You've always had basically a, a black power fist up as a little mm -hmm. kid. And basically, Joel, I just didn't like the way Black communities looked in every city that I went to. There was always a hood. There was mm -hmm. always an underserved community that was right behind downtown where mm -hmm. everything was hustling and bustling and so many resources. And then right over the train track or right over the divider line, it was just devastation. And I just couldn't understand how that happened, which we understand it's been systemic for for decades sure. and centuries now and uh so putting all that together just helped me find my purpose early on as an entrepreneur that said you know i want to do well by doing good and uh thank you for that in the opening mm -hmm. uh, for that and i feel good at what what i do by doing well by doing good at the same time yeah yeah i, I think that's very important because um you know you can get out here you can make money doing a, a lot of things but I was talking to someone the other day about, you know, what really is success? Is it money in your bank account or is it fulfillment? Right. Yes. And yes. those are two different things. You can be very successful and not be a billionaire. Yes. Right. Because yes. it's all about fulfillment. So I certainly appreciate that. And, and I had to laugh about, um, you know, you and those boots, because we, we obviously had a similar upbringing. You know, I didn't grow up in Detroit. I grew up in, this, in New York City, but okay. you know, with snow and, and putting those, those socks on with the plastic bags over your feet. Yes. You dry and all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Most people don't know about that. But <laughs> no, they don't know about that, Joel. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days, man. Oh, man, that's funny. That is really funny. So, but um, yeah, but no, very, very good point. Now, one of the things that I noticed that um, you guys focus on, one of your taglines, is uh, the, the term um, purposeful living, you know, purposeful living. And I thought about that and I said, you know, that's, that's interesting. What is purposeful living? We have a lot of people that just, you know, they watch the sun come up and go down every day, right? Or they're just working this nine to five and it's like, when I retire, I'm gonna go take a trip to Florida, you know? I mean, it's just this grind. And then some people even in worse situations, because I know you're focused on some of the lowest income individuals in the city. So how, how would you define purposeful living? What does that mean to you? Yeah, Joel, I would define purposeful living. Uh, let me define it from what I what we have for what we look at our residents for. Mm -hmm. uh, you did ask me if I was a veteran or not. I am a veteran of the U.S. Army, so I wanted okay. to put that out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, not purposeful living on myself. Obviously, I, I talked about finding my purpose uh, early. But when it seems that in the housing sector, uh, it, it was always that a person is always going to grow their income. They're always going to uh, basically aspire to be more than what they are. And you know what we found is that there there's a population that sh we, we shouldn't be judging just because their bank account doesn't grow or their income levels don't you know, escalate to wherever, right? There's a group of people that are poor people, or we would say lower income people that are going to live within those means. And they may not ever go back to college or get that higher paying job. But that doesn't mean that they're not successful in their life. They're not, quote unquote, building wealth internally with other things that the market only use as a benchmark. You know, you you said, is your bank account bigger? You know, do you have this many assets? You know, what about that asset that you can get up and actually get to your health provider, right? We saw yeah. that COVID that the hospital said, stay home. Mm -hmm. Don't come, don't even come to the hospital. I mean, yeah. have we thought we was going to hear <laughs> that in our lifetime that the hospital was going to say, don't come here, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, but it said stay home. But what about those individuals that don't even have a home, rental or homeowner? So, so we we found that the purpose uh, of purposeful living is much bigger and broader than somebody who 
looks like the front of the book cover. And uh, I'm excited to champion different ways of being purposeful than what is traditionally out there. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good point. You know, it, it's interesting because you look at the um, the struggle of, of so many minorities. We know that a lot of them were exposed to COVID because they were essential workers, yes. right? They were driving the buses. They were drive, riding, driving the trains. They were doing all these things that uh, basically, in essence, exposed them and, and didn't allow them to stay home, you know, from that standpoint. Uh, and then you mentioned about, you know, the, the lowest uh, level of, of income individuals that may not even have adequate housing. I think that's interesting because, um, you know, for the longest we saw in Detroit, as well as where I grew up, you know, plenty of public housing, right? And a lot of them became ghettos because that was just the mindset. Let's just dump all the poor people together. Um, you know, explain to me a little bit, though, how your model has helped turn that around because I know this to be a fact, but if you give people something nice and you integrate the, the housing, um, you're able to help raise them up to a level where it's like, well, I don't have to live with everything all torn up. You know, I yes. can maintain what I have and, and have some self-esteem about myself as well. So yeah. I don't want to do all the talking. You tell me about that. <laughs> yeah, Joe, definitely. I can hit, hit uh, an example for you about that. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Was public housing a design that in the beginning was, was thought on paper to be the best thing? You know, um, you know, it was this government housing that was uh, a, 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 a offshoot of, you know, after the wars that, you know, government had to step in and provide some type of catalyst or some type of environment where they could help people live because things were in a disarray. Mm -hmm. uh, when I look at what what we talk about the the projects or uh, those particular uh, turned into to, when your terms the ghetto, um, you know I think the services were not there. We were looking at people that felt oh if you just give them a place to live at such a low uh, rent rate that they would basically everything in their life, everything else in their life, the offshoot, they would be able to maximize, right? Oh, they'll go to college, they'll get better jobs, they'll uh, get a car, uh, you know, they'll move on to home ownership. But something had them in that position to need to be in, quote unquote, the projects in the first place. And it's typically the uh, social determinants are not just one thing, just because I have low income, I couldn't find a job. It's, it's things on top of that. So what Quest does different is our DNA, as, as I talked in the opening about our support services under our Quest Cares banner, Quest Cares is where we offer those services to the individuals that are housed in our properties that help them be the better them, whatever that is individually for you. Now, sure, do we have a baseline that we have case managers? If you're addicted to drugs, we're going to supply addicted addictive disease counselors to you if you got a mental illness sure you're having a therapist but other things may be uh, a veteran hey i want to deal with this ptsd you know um you know i'm paranoid or i'm schizo or whatever or one may be i feel depressed because my whole 20 years somebody told me how to get up at what time to get up, what time to go to bed, what to wear, gave me money. But I saw some things while I was there and, and it messed my mind up, but I loved it. And now you come home and I've always said that job, some of those jobs that were in the military, they're not over here in the civilian world. you know. So just imagine if you were an infantry person that was built to kill, you can't come home and say, where is the job for me to go and you know kill somebody? That's yeah. <laughs> that's not quote unquote what the police or yeah. you know those structures are supposed to do. So there is a population of people that we have to take care of and wrap services around so they can transition accordingly and properly. So yeah, if it's not for the services, low income housing alone is not going to help catapult a person to the next level just because they only pay, you know, 20, 30% of, of the rent. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate you sharing that. It goes a little bit deeper than that. Yeah. And I wanted you to dive into that a little bit as well, because um, you have, uh, and you can break this out as, as you choose to do so, but you have uh, your youth initiatives, you have healthcare, uh, OGT and employment, case management. Um, what are some of these other things that you're doing related to that that's really helping individuals uh, that getting your housing, maintain the housing, and um, and then we'll pivot a little bit back to development as well. But I, I wanted to talk about this because this is important. You know, if you get people in the housing, how do you work to uplift them and not keep them at the same level? And to your point, if you're not providing these other services that they need, you know, just housing alone is not going to cut it, which Correct. is what, what public Correct. housing has done. So, you know, how how... You know, explain these these other areas that you have here, the youth initiatives, healthcare, and all the rest of it. Yeah, I can explain that to you, Joel. Uh, yes, and it can lead into our development there. You know, first of all, it has to be someone that's intentionally <clears throat> out here in the development space that's saying, I'm going to develop for this lower income population. You know, in any other training that we've probably gone through or, or, or books we've read in the real estate world, it doesn't say... Uh, develop for the lowest paying, sometimes the hardest and difficult group to work with uh, for your for your model, for your mm -hmm. capital stack, right? To be able to pay my investors, you go and get the lowest paying people. So if we know that, then who's going to develop for them? And Quest and myself have just said, we're, make, we're intentional about that. We say to everybody, yes, somebody has to do it. And if the market is not going to do it, then we'll do it. So why is it important? What do we offer to help an individual? As I stated earlier, sometimes that individual is going to stay with us in a rental setting. That is, they're going to be building more of their inner self or their surrounding self, right? That may be getting connected to uh, low-cost martyr tokens so that they can travel around the city, that may be getting connected to the food banks or subsidized markets for food or even access to certain foods um, because of their income structure. They can't, you can't be in an extremely low income income structure and then shopping in the mainstream America. It's just going to use all your money up. So our case management team help plug those gaps or make those connections because there is an undercurrent of. Uh, for example, uh, you see low-income people going to check cashing places or liquor stores, right? Because a lot of times they're not able to be in that banking system, which is the mainstream system mm -hmm. anymore because of either overwithdrawn on the accounts or so on and so forth, being on the blacklist, have you. Uh, but when they go to these liquor stores and these uh, check cashing places, they have even become more predatory. Uh, so it seemed like there's a creation of under markets that create really some good options to mainstream, but eventually they start to prey upon that being that under market. You know, sure, should there be some other spaces where if you're quote unquote unbankable, that you could be in a finance way? And that's where you see all these debit cards showing up, these third party uh put your check on these cards. I mean, that's just the fintech world being a different option than the traditional banking market. So I say all this to say that's what the that's what Quest brings to the table. One, we collaborate and we have a collective impact model. Joel, I couldn't sit here today and say we do all of these services ourselves in-house. Mm -hmm. We partner with multiple nonprofits to deliver an impact that is led by Quest. So our Quest Westside Impact Center is our latest initiative that was a commercial. In your world, Gerald, this is an office retail building, 30,000 square foot building, glass brick, elevators, you uh, parking structure, you name it. In the commercial <laughs> CRA space, it's a straight A, a property, right? Mm -hmm. um, in our world, it's a property, but all the tenants are nonprofit corporations, mm. right? Or agencies. Uh, we do have a for-profit, which is Family Dollar, which was a long-term uh, tenant when we acquired the failing subdivision, I mean, a, a retail plaza. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a carryover of them. 
or just start to look at how the complexities are starting to, 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 to go there as we move into development. A nonprofit development corporation targets a retail plaza, acquires it, absorbs the tenancy that's in there, which is made up of a big box company, family dollar, mm -hmm. and we want to convert it to a nonprofit impact center that uh, aligned nonprofits and uh, complementary services to what we do in housing to be in one space. So not only do we have to understand the complexities of getting the nonprofits, which is our sector, now we have to be experts on the landlord side trying to deal with the family dollar that's, you know, done this a hundred times in their sleep, mm -hmm. uh, you know, trying to negotiate with such a, a big type of tenant. I mean, it was just- yeah, Make a bully you too. Yeah, and they, man, they tried to bully you. I'll tell you on this <laughs> podcast, hey, I put my gloves on, Joel, and I was going right back at them, man. I wasn't playing with family dollar, but we got to the end of the road, you know. I got a couple bruises, but they got uh -huh. some too. Let's just put it like that. Yeah, see how they look, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go see how they look. Send them back oh, up man. Hey, good. Yeah, yeah. So now that, that's a valuable point. And, and by the way, we're getting close to the... Um, the uh, bottom of the hour. So if you guys have questions that are in the waiting room, your participants, uh, you can start putting those in the chat or start raising your virtual hand and we will uh, get you involved in the discussion here. But, um, you know, going back to that, uh, you know, we started off talking about housing, but I think it's interesting to note, you've been elaborating a little bit on what you've been doing outside of just housing. So you're doing office buildings, you're doing a lot of other things. What are some of these other asset classes that you have gone into uh, and, and what's the reason behind it? Uh, you mentioned a retail shopping center to house some nonprofits. Well, what else you guys are doing in addition to just straight housing? And is the housing just multifamily? Is it single family? I mean, you know, what are you guys up to? Well, let me give you, let me break it down to you, Joel. Okay. On our housing side, which is up under our Quest Communities Business Unit, we do affordable housing, which is multifamily uh, and single family. We do supportive housing, which is traditionally in our multifamily side of things. And we do what we call community facilities, but it's really our commercial uh, side of the house. Uh, we own, develop, and manage the West Side Works uh, complex that we have over on the West Side, which is home to multiple nonprofits in the workforce development space. Mm -hmm. What got us into this commercial space is we had in our, our office, we were growing as a, as a company from, you know, starting with myself as the founder and moving up to now 40 plus employees, you know, uh, five commercial buildings at this time, and multiple multifamily communities uh, and a portfolio of single family. The, the commercial space started to say, where are you going to offer these services? Our model changed a little bit, Joel. You may remember, remember on some of the old movies back in the day with Ice Cube and any movie that was about Black community where the social worker used to show up and knock on the door, yeah. right? And, and they give them a hard time. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the movie. I think it was Boys in the Hoods. I can't remember, but <laughs> you know, the guy came and knocked on the door and he <laughs> told him, don't come over here, you know, mm -hmm. this time of morning because he wasn't up yet. Yeah. Uh, we used to do that. We used to go to the individual's units and provide the care. But now Quest is kind of, change that just a little bit where we do have office space built out in our apartment communities um, where the case manager could really invite that individual out of the unit, come talk with them in private uh, and deal with you know what, what they're dealing with. Now, do, do our case managers still have to maybe go knock on some doors to, to, to do what they do? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then workforce. We couldn't do all the workforce training. We knew that jobs and income was uh, instrumental to moving and navigating in community and in the environment. Uh, so instead of creating our own workforce program, we partnered with the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. Uh, they birthed Westside Works, uh, brought in multiple nonprofits. We went out and secured all of the funding to build a two-phase development a 13,000 square foot training facility known as Complex One. And then the Complex Two was the administrative support building for uh, the Westside Works training facility. 
Uh, and then finally, we said, shucks, we need a place that nonprofits could get together because they were all scattered around community in what I would consider sub subpar rental arrangements. Mm -hmm. You know, we were operating out of a house. We might catch another nonprofit just in the back of another building. Mm -hmm. And doing more with less has, has just been the way to go as nonprofits. And we decided, no, we need to look like a business. We need to look like these businesses that are out there. So when these corporations come and see us, they can understand we know this this line of work. So so yeah, when you come to when I go downtown office building, I see glass, I see all I see the corner office, mm -hmm. I see a conference room. So when you come to Quest, that's what you see. So we got to get you and your team out because yeah. we 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 want to make sure that we weren't looking mom and pop anymore. Mm -hmm. Because if you look mom and pop, they treat you mom and pop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially when you're negotiating with Family Dollar, right? So exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got some um, experience. You sound like you got some experience with that, or hey, something. Hey, man, I, I've been in this game for a minute, so yeah, I, I know how crazy things could be. So <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, you you bring up a good point because uh, you know, even this podcast, we've um. We're in the middle of uh, finishing our, our paperwork. Actually, it's already been submitted for um, 501c3 status. Okay. And uh, we've got part of that done already and completed. And, um, you know, we're looking at ways that we can not bog ourselves down, but still deploy capital into good opportunities like this and provide value for people that need housing and other things. So, you know, that's definitely a, a conversation that, that we probably need to have, um, you know, down at your office, some point of mine, you know, either one. And uh, yeah. you know, get together and talk about that. But um, Joel, let, me, that's let me jump in there real quick, yeah, Joel. Please. When you said mm -hmm. that capital, wanted to um, highlight. You know, we are fastly approaching the initial offering of a Quest Impact Fund that we will be rolling out as a way to have investors mm -hmm. put some capital up. You know, we do a good job at targeting government dollars. Mm -hmm. We do a good job at targeting ph philanthropy, but we do find ourselves at the end of the capital stack with a small amount that's needed that could really uh, be filled with some investors. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided that uh, after a little bit more um, due diligence, we're going to make a decision. We're strongly leaning toward that Joel to come out and roll out the new Quest Impact Fund, which will be basically dollars brought in from corporations, philanthropy, uh, high wealth individuals, and, and middle income individuals with disposable income. Uh, we will have a limit on what the, the, the floor is, mm -hmm. uh, but for individuals to, to provide capital, uh, for us to invest that into these type of impact deals. So we are looking for those who understand impact, those who will be willing to take a lower return on their investment and have this money to be a little more patient on a return than what they would see in a traditional portfolio. Uh, and we think we would be able to be successful at that, probably rolling out about 30 to $50 million first offering. And mm -hmm. we're this close. So yes, let's circle back up because uh, that's going to be something I'd love to come back, back on your show to maybe get some um, you know, awareness about. Sure, sure. Now that that sounds good. Um, just you you brought up the point of of lower returns, and one question for investors is how long would that money need to stay deployed? I know the fund's not out yet, but what's your what's your thinking on that? Is it going to mirror like an OZ fund, or is it just a different model altogether? Yeah, ten to fifteen year. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah. So so somewhat similar to that. Yeah. Um, I I do want to also just out of fairness, um, there there is as I mentioned, a, a reason I asked you to come on here because, you know, we've been putting together deals for a long time and most people don't realize the work that goes into doing a development deal. So you'll have, you know, your, your debt that comes in, you'll have your LP equity, the limited partner equity, then you have your general partner equity. And generally those three pieces get it done. But when you are talking about dealing with people that are 20% AMI, you know, and AMI is average median income, you have people that are 20% AMI, you know, and those numbers just don't pencil. You're like, I can't buy the dirt and I can't build the building because I can't build a C quality building. It has to be A grade, right? 
just because of the materials that you put in and all new finishes. So how do I get this to work? And see, this is the reason for everyone listening, why you have a struggle of affordable housing in urban centers, because the dirt gets so expensive that you just can't afford to do the projects. And so all the poor people get pushed out and more affluent people come in. You know, I look at Manhattan, for example. I mean, you can get a 800 square foot condo for a million five, and that's like the floor. Yes. I mean, it's just unbelievable, right? And how much money you got to make a month to pay a million five mortgage, right? Yes, so, yes. So, but, but that's typically what happens because of not being able to bring that capital in. So if, if you can, just for the sake of our audience, explain, you know, and without giving away all the, all the secret sauce, but, but how do you get these deals done um, when you do have that gap in capital because you're, you're never going to make the numbers pencil at a return that's north of, let's say, 10%, you know, especially if you're going to be in it for 10 years? You know, how do you do that? Yeah, Joel, you hit it on. The, you call it the uh, secret sauce. You know, you're the you want the eleven herbs and spices. You know, this, <laughs> this is KFC. You have it your way, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, it is very difficult to have a capital stack mm -hmm. outside of you know your debt, your LP, your GP on a traditional real estate deal. Uh, definitely under ten percent, and we're looking under you know, three to one, one to three percent. Um, our our rubric is basically the nonprofit has provided a vehicle to bring in soft dollars that is basically buying down the cost of these units. And that has been the only way for us to do this. Uh, 23, 22, 23 years on the nonprofit side, uh, the for-profit side is totally um, external to our nonprofit side, right? Uh, it's it's where the fund will be housed. Mm -hmm. It's doing some third-party consulting uh, here and there, uh, but it is the vehicle that will inject some investments into uh the nonprofit deal but how do we serve 30 percent it's got to be grant dollars it has to be grant dollars and that's what the, the uh, for-profit side is doing it can be government contracts that are sometimes comes out with these friendly products that are compliance based or orderly period based mm -hmm. might say hey you can i'll give you this money you know it'll be interest only uh, 30 year affordability. If you can do that, you can have the money. Uh, what we're also finding is there is uh, some philanthropic groups that's out here that's saying, I'll make an investment in you. Um, I'll give you a loan, uh, but the but the, it's so soft that it looks like a grant and feels like a grant. But to, to them, it's a loan and mm -hmm. it's causing you to do what you said you're going to do with this money right. so that you don't catch these uh, you know, basically for-profit developers developing, saying, I'm going to help, I'm going to give some units to low-income people. They get the money and say, ah, to make the deal work, I had to up the rents so that this deal can pencil. So these uh, philanthropic groups are saying, okay, well, forget that grant stuff. Since we can't give a grant to for-profit, we'll mm -hmm. do these, these program-related in, in loans uh, just to, to hold your feet to the fire. And I'll end on this, Joel. Mm -hmm. The triple bottom line of finance, environment, and social, you know, we typically always hit the finance one. That's what we're penciling the bottom line. You know, we organically might absorb the environment piece, right? Hey, you know, we, you know, we're not purposefully buying hazardous material. We're not trying to produce gases and this, this, and that. But sometimes we we just totally forget about the social piece. That's the third bottom line in the triple bottom line. And just it's just we've totally just given that up. And 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 me, when I you know learned this back in the day through my education, I just kept saying, I don't understand why companies don't uh incorporate the social impact that they could have day one uh to win. To, to, to win that change that's in community. So we pride ourselves in uh, being a nonprofit developer. Sometimes people, I, I remember my first time introducing myself really as a 
nonprofit developer. The room I was in was all for profit. I was the only nonprofit developer. And I tell you, Joe, they laughed at me, right? Yeah. You know, they kind of chuckled and said, how do those words even go together? <laughs> I was just like, oh, man, you know me, I'm a, I was a little fiery. I'm thinking, you don't, you don't laugh at me when I say something. When that laugh didn't feel like you was laughing with me, it sounded like you was laughing at me. So if you laugh at me, I'm going to ask you, why are you laughing at me? Right, right. So, um, mm-hmm. so then, you know, so, but that was just, that's really just really the, the social, the, the mission and all that. It's sad that we have to say nonprofit developer because we really shouldn't have to use your tax status to describe you in a sense, but we have to show that line in the sand so that certain people will know the direction you, 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 you live for. So that's, you know, that's on one hand, good on one hand. It's, it's sad. We have to do it like that. Right. Right. Yeah. I was going to mention also that um, I noticed, uh, I believe some of your, your funding comes from uh, MUFG, which is a, you know, a, a Japanese bank. Um, I know them from Singapore. That's where I, I run across them. Okay. Um, but I thought that was kind of interesting that you've been able to, to pull in capital from from overseas. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's it's impressive, you know, to to be able to do that. Um, I found the Japanese investors similar to the Koreans in that they're very, very conservative, uh, but they are able to accept lower returns. Um, you know, how did how did that actually work out? I mean, is, is it, um, you know, anything that you don't mind sharing, you know, but I, I thought that was pretty interesting to be able to not only reach beyond Georgia, but reach beyond our national or uh, the national boundaries as well. Yeah, yeah, Joel, reaching out outside of local presence to national to international, uh, I'll tell you, we did not target international companies to to go after. We're just getting to getting ready to roll out something to try to go to national organizations. But again, our work spoke for ourselves. Honestly, uh, Mm -hmm. that organization and I did some research about us, not sure how they, they found us, reached out, said they were, you know, looking at our work. They saw what we stood for, the impacts that we have, asked a few more questions, and a blind um, donation came our way. Mm-hmm. And um, each year, it's, um, it's just uh, we, don't, we don't have any other information to share uh because it is private okay okay yeah. yeah well no that's that's i mean but it it says something it's a testimony yeah. to doing what you say you're going to do that's and you basically know. that's what it is joel yeah. we you know there's people out there scanning and they're yeah. looking at all groups like this and every now and then if you look at the mckinsey scott that's going on now people people talking about they they looked in their bank account and and millions of dollars were were, were coming their way um uh, so there are groups out here that that have philanthropy or, or ways to invest that find what they care about. They go out there and find it and they give to it and they don't want to be on the front page news um, or want you to contact them. They feel good about knowing where their money went. And uh, that is a testament to the different layers of how you bring in investments. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the fact that, <clears throat> you know, you you went out to to do the right thing. You know, it wasn't when you started this, well, I hope I get this Japanese investor to, you know, I mean, nobody starts business with that mindset, you know, and and I'm sure you didn't have that mindset either. And, um, you know, but just doing the right thing and doing it over time and sticking with it, uh, obviously has paid dividends. So, you know, congratulations to that. Hey, thank you, Joe. It's been a hard road, man. 20, 22 years, 2001, you know, it's days that we say, Man, it's it's hard, you know. It's hard out here, you know. Is it yeah. time to make mm-hmm. this up? And uh, you know, you just really for me, I just look out my office. I used to be a guy, Joel, when I first started. Every new person that came into our housing models or our housing community, I would go meet them, introduce myself. You know, basically open door. Still mm-hmm. have an open door, but my my um, commitment is has shifted a little bit. It's really about the staff now. When I look out and see, you know, I have to keep this company going because I have 40 plus individuals that depend on this company to be here. 
-hmm. you know, they depend on their check to come in uh, based off the work that they have provided for this company. So, um, you know, with COVID, that was that was a clear message. Uh, you know, we just you just don't want to have to send anybody home. So, you know, I wake up every day because I want to make sure that these families are not impacted negatively. Uh, now, do we lose people? Sure. Do people move on and people still quest employees? Yes, they do. And I just take it as a as a badge of honor when I see a company woo a person away from me. Uh, I would love to be able to pay more as a nonprofit, and I don't like to use that because I try to pay mark at least seventy five percent to the market rate. Uh, but we do get people to leave uh, that went to on to bigger companies, and all I say is that's a testament to the work that you've done here, what we've poured into you. And now these companies are coming for you because they see the work that was done. So I don't look at it like, like negatively. I look at it positively. Yeah. They see the value. So yes, very good point. Very good point. Um, all right. Well, sounds good. Well, I, I do had a, another couple of questions, but again, our, our guests, if you have any questions, put those in the chat or raise your virtual hand. We want to make sure we get those in. We're grateful that you joined us today. So, uh, and I guess I didn't have to uh, even finish my sentence because Natalie Jerome has popped up. So <laughs> Natalie, uh, Roland, if you can unmute her um, and, and let her give her question, that'll be great. All right, thank you for being here, Natalie. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi, Leonard. Good afternoon. Um, Hi, I'm Natalie, I saw your chat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that too. <laughs> well, I'd like to say that um, I'm glad that you're, um, definitely growing as the years go by and everything that you're doing. Um, I remember you speaking at uh, my REAP graduation in 2018, and you were a panelist recently at the DEVELOP conference. So I always enjoy hearing you speak and hearing how far you've come. Um, my question is um, about resources on a much, much smaller scale. Uh, my interest is in infill development. Um, I feel like we can all get, you know, 10 friends and get a few homes out of the land bank or, um, you know, drive for dollars and, you know, uh, just kind of, you know, rehab, um, abandoned uh, homes or just do um, things on a much smaller scale that could give neighborhoods a facelift. Um, and I find that uh, for grants and, um, you know, resources, it's usually for much larger uh, projects. Um, and so do you have any suggestions or do you see um, any sources of funding either through your nonprofits or through the city agencies or anything that you're seeing in the metro Atlanta area um, for small scale development or infill development just for individuals or uh, you know, smaller businesses that would like to rehab a home and be um, a landlord to, you know, uh, the 30% AMI population, you know, that could uh, help out. Got you. Well, thank you, Natalie, for that question. Uh, may I ask, are you uh, positioning yourself as a nonprofit or, or for-profit or just an individual? Uh, for-profit. Okay, Even gotcha. though Nonprofit is not off the table, but it is, you know, a process, obviously. Got you. Well, I did hear you say the word grants, and that's why I was asking you. Sometimes we have for-profit positioning individuals that basically are out here looking for resources, and they, you know, use the word grants or think that grants could be a part of their mix. I haven't really seen any lenders that are championing that they're giving grants to for-profits, Right. But um, I would say to this infield piece and this uh, mid, you know, up and coming or emerging developer, I would say a couple of places, Invest Atlanta, I know you've probably heard of them and probably even looked at them, but Invest Atlanta, uh, Enterprise Community Partners, uh, and a thing called, if you would Google CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, they are basically the banks in the, commu the community world that's designed for small businesses, for housing, that could really get into uh, smaller emerging uh, markets. 
I will say that that market is, is there. We came up in that market and eventually you move out of that market. So like a quest, we're not into the one-off, two-off fixer-uppers anymore, but that we used to be into that. So it, it goes to show that the market is always evolving. So you're right, there is room for that. So I would say three resources, CDFIs in your area, hopefully, they are in the local level and then they're kind of regional and national. I would start more on the local ones. Uh, invest Atlanta, even if it's just to be educational, I would get through the Invest Atlanta system. They do have an emerging developer cohort that they roll out from time to time, but I would look into their small business uh, side of the house and then their uh, housing loan funds that they have. And then Enterprise Community Partners is a little larger where they're national, uh, but they have local office here in the Atlanta area. Does that help you a little bit, Natalie? It does. Um, I have looked into those resources, um, and I would say that the um, experience piece is where I get hung up because I have not done this before. So... Um, I would say um, I have some things to work through with uh, maybe being able to partner with some experienced um, individuals or companies um, or Quest. <laughs> to, uh, Give us a call. Give us a call, Natalie. <laughs> okay. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. I'm for real, okay? Okay. I appreciate that. I will. Thank you. Ready. All right. Well, you, you got to ask for what you want, right? <laughs> so I ain't mad at you, Natalie. <laughs> But it sounds like that that's the solution. I mean, it's some type of partnership so that, um, you know, they can bring the the track record that's needed and, and kind of go from there. So uh, very good point from that standpoint. And then you put your, your email there in the chat. So appreciate that. Uh, very good. Very good. So appreciate that, Natalie, for, for joining in. Um, any other questions that might come up? One thing I, I did want to address is... Um, you know, we've had a lot of talk over the years of the, the George Floyd situation and tons of money, you know, being promised. And, you know, I've, I've said this multiple times on the show that uh, sometimes it feels like Haiti. You know, it's like, hey, we're going to give all this money to the Haitians. Right. And then over time, it's like, well, we haven't found a way to deploy. So let's just put that back over here in the common fund. And then everybody just kind of does the moonwalk and backs away. and You don't hear nothing about it anymore. Um, how have, have you seen any dollars, especially since you're on the nonprofit front, uh, flowing from all the promises made around George Floyd and his murder, uh, you know, that that's benefited Quest or have you seen flow in general just in the marketplace? We're really curious as to whether those dollars are actually making it in the dirt in neighborhoods or is it just still kind of out there on the cloud? Yeah, Joel, to, to your point. Uh, George Floyd, I mean, rest is so, it was a devastating period in time that triggered a lot of that particular funding to come to community. And I mean, in droves, but you're right. Has some reached the, reached the ground in communities? I would have to say yes, because we've been a recipient of those funds and we okay. put them into the ground. Good to know. Uh, in the nonprofit sector, in the uh, for-profit sector or the market, I would say yes. But I do think it's a phase, a, 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 a phase in time. If we're not careful, that that system that was already there that produced a lot of that barriers to access or deployment of funds in black and brown communities or black and brown companies, that system just didn't just because George Floyd got murdered, it just didn't go away right? Just didn't <laughs> stop operating. It hit a speed bump, uh, but it's so able to, to um, what do you call it, adapt, that it hit that speed bump, and it by the time it hit the ground, it had already created the new way that it was going to operate in this DEI world, right? So you got this DEI world that's out here, and it's, it's trying to, you know, uh, keep this speed bump alive, but the system then already kind of moved on. And uh, if we're not careful, this quote unquote black led organizations or black funds, uh, they're just going to disappear because people are going to start using it against us. 
Uh, why do we need the black fund? You know, why, why, why are these black companies getting in? Eventually it's going to come back out. But for the, but, but for, we wouldn't be in this situation if these systemic issues wasn't here in the first place. So yes, they got it. it the system needs to be a, a reroute. Really, it needs to be a new system. Uh, basically, it's a lemon. And you know, if you keep that lemon engine, you mm. can plug all the holes you want. It's a lemon. Yeah. Even if you plug <laughs> this one, it's going to leak somewhere else. It's going to, you know, it's going to cause smoke to come out the tailpipe. We got to have a, a whole new system. And, um, you know, so again, uh, I do think that system is just too uh, evolving, and I just I cannot understand how how that system moves so quickly uh, to anything that happens. It finds a way to push the power back to the power structures. Uh, so basically, there's some other stuff going on behind the curtains that we don't know about because I just can't believe we we just haven't been creative and innovative enough to make those impact. We were just talking about housing uh, numbers of home ownership from the 60s at uh, white to black families. I think it was 28% to 69% to white families of home ownership compared to black home ownership. And now it, the gap is even wider. Mm. So, you know, 40, 50 years later, and I'm thinking, what is going on here? You know, when all of these things have been put in place for us to, uh, when I say us, I'm saying Black people and Brown people to gain access and and, and get into these circles and, and take advantage of these programs. And then you look 40 years down the road, and you're like, hey, we've been reversed. But when you look outside, you say, oh, I know Joe owns a home, Leonard owns a home, and People on this call own the home, but then when you look at the broader numbers, it's just it's just not there because for every one of us, fifty or hundred went to prison that year. You know, you know, uh, another this has been held out of raises and merits because of the color of their skin. So those are the un the the knowns that we know, but the data is not really producing a true number. Um, the reason for the true number, I, I would say that, and we all know it's a uh, it's color of skin, and and uh, you know today it's just the fight continues. Let's just put it like this, Joel. The fight continues, and uh, I think Natalie said it. You know, if I'm out there, you know, I'm a black man. I have to. You, you, there's no way or, about it. When I'm on the stage, you see me, mm -hmm. and when I go in the room, it's known. And um, you know, do you know that you're a white man? That's that's the that's the the, the other piece. It's, I think our counterparts got to know they're part of the product or problem that created this systemic problem and own it. You know, I always said to one white guy that asked me about George Floyd, I told him, I don't, we're not, I'm not saying you have slaves in your backyard right now, but if we track you back, there could be a chance that you your your forefathers had some in the backyard and if you want to just turn the eye to that like it's not me uh that's not going to get it you got to say yes my my great 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 daddy did have it and push down some some thoughts about that to my blood to to my you know blood line and um i want to do something different about it and you know he felt that that was offensive to to say that some of his people might have owned slaves. And I'm thinking, well, I, I accept that some of my ancestors were slaves. Do you think I want to run around saying I had people that was hung from trees and, you know, took from their land and 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 made to build America? So after we spent it, you know, we we spent it. We built this with nothing, with our bare hands. But it's, I'm not excited about my great, great ancestors hanging from a tree. You know, I would I would rather not have that not done. So let me get off of that because we <laughs> we're not on that box today, George. Yeah, yeah, you you are going in a different direction. <laughs> yeah, man, give me back, call me we, back in, we, George. We see the passion. We see the passion. Hey, tell Carlos to call me in. Come on, Carlos. Yeah, there you go. Give me the there sign. You go. Something like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But I will agree with you. We we definitely need a, a new system of things, without a doubt. So yeah. you know that that goes without saying. Um, you mentioned a term also just for our audience. I want to make sure they're clear on that. You made reference to DEI. Um, I know what that is. If, if you don't mind, share with the audience what do you mean by DEI? 
Yeah, when I say DEI, I think I'm saying the uh, short term for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, they're very good. So just wanted to make sure we, we got that out there. So um, th this has been a, a very interesting conversation. Uh, you know, generally, when we talk with folks, you know, there, it's all about bigger and better and more profit and this and that. Um, but you've done an amazing job in just focusing on the people that are at that lower rim of DE, of not DEI, of AMI. Yes. rather, and, and being able to uh, provide housing for those individuals. It, it's certainly a challenge, you know, but with all of the um, institutions that are out here and the grants and the nonprofits and other things, uh, you've shown that it can be done and you've been doing it for 20 some years now. So that's very exciting. And we want to certainly uh, give you credit for that because that, that's an amazing thing and it's quite impressive. And uh, we certainly appreciate it. Do you have any plans to grow beyond Atlanta with this model? Or I know you said you were from Detroit. Detroit, yeah. need some help. Hey, you know? I need some help, man. Hey, my city, Detroit, needs some help. Uh, surrounding yeah. cities need need this. Well, we got some eleven herbs over here that we <laughs> we we didn't we didn't perfected the, the the model almost, but we do think for our future growth, Joel, we will have to probably pick quests up. Mm -hmm. and drop it in other communities. You know, I always wanted to work Quest out of business. I would love for it to be no more no more homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. I would love for people not to be on drugs. I would love the uh, mental health to be managed and livable. I would love people to have a livable wage and they don't need a Quest. But for right now, we need a Quest. We need a Quest. And, uh, <laughs> we need Quest. And that means other communities outside the West Side need it. So yes, I do believe we're going to package our model and figure out a way to drop it in community without having to do 20 plus years to get to the scale. We got to be able to just drop that puzzle piece down yeah. and kind of take off from there. I can't start with one house in the next community. It'll just take too long for transformation. Yeah, yeah. No, very good point. So appreciate you sharing that. And, and believe it or not, that's that's an excellent way to end our discussion. I mean, we're right at the top of the hour. And um you know, that's an excellent summation to, to what's going on and, and what you're trying to do. So, you know, we really appreciate having you on and, and all the insights that you shared today. Uh, any additional final comments that you want to share with our audience as we wrap up? Hey, you guys listen to the with Joel in the morning, met this, this brother at a uh, development conference. He's doing his thing. Make sure your listeners know that you're a leader out here in the sector. And thank you for having this vehicle for us to share our thoughts. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll certainly keep in touch offline and, and everything else. And hopefully we'll get to do some business together pretty soon. So we'll see how this all comes yeah. together. Yeah, certainly appreciate that. So for all you guys, yeah. thank you so much. You still got that fist up, huh? <laughs> like your mama said. Power fist, baby. Power fist. <laughs> oh, man. Well, hey, this has been the Mornings with Joel CRE Podcast. Thank you so much for being in attendance. Thank you for participating as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week. Have a great week and enjoy the show. Have a great day. You've been listening to Mornings with Joel, commercial real estate podcast, where we focus on rising stars and established players in commercial real estate and talk to them about how they are building legacies in today's marketplace. Please check back weekly to hear our upcoming guests.